Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. This week, I'm very happy to have Dr. Brian Koenig on the podcast. Brian is the head coach of the Frederick Gunn School in Washington, Connecticut, which is a NEPSAC Class B school. And one of the things that I love about this conversation is that Brian is a doctor uh, in clinical psychology. So he is not only a coach, but he is the school's head counselor. And in this day and age, post-COVID, where there's a lot of depression going on, a lot of anxiety among today's youth, we really get into what some of the problems are, what some of the suggestions are, how he incorporates that as a coach, and much, much more. So we don't do as much coach speak here as a normal episode, but if you're a player, if you're a parent of a teenager right now, uh, there is some valuable information here that I learned for the first time that I think you can apply to both your mental well-being, which will ultimately apply uh, to your athletic career. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Coach Do- or Dr. Brian Koenig to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm not, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Now, you're a clinical psychologist, and you also coach high school prep basketball. Are there anyone, is there anyone else in America that has that designation? It's interesting. Um, the coach at Millbrook, Billy Tom, oh, yeah. just got his, uh, I think, master's in social work or master's in counseling. So he's in the kind of mental health uh, area, but I don't know. I don't know of another uh, clinical psychologist now. How does it help you in your coaching? Um, so I think it, so there's different types of psychology. Mm-hmm. The type of psychology that I'm most um affiliated with my theoretical orientation is behavioral psychology so in that sense i i've studied and have a lot of training and how to get how to modify behavior help people change behavior patterns or change the way they think or feel about things and so it really plays in nicely to -to day-to-day operations of a basketball team um in the sense that i'm constantly trying to figure out a way to get the kids to do what I think is in the, their and the team's best interest. Yeah. I mean, it has been that saying always like, you know, part of its coach, part of us being a psychologist, the the bus driver, all that stuff. And you are literally also the psychologist. So great example on that. Uh, You are at Frederick Gunn school. Give me your pitch Uh, for those listening out there that don't know anything about Frederick Gunn. You know, why would a prospective player want to entertain that as an option to look at? Right, so we play in the NEPSAC uh, Basketball Conference, so New England Prep School Basketball, which is known to be, like, in my what I've heard is the best basketball conference in the country. So I think that right there is an awesome opportunity. The Frederick Gunn School is in um, Washington, Connecticut, and so that's Western Connecticut, and there's a lot of boarding school activity around us, so it's a very vibrant kind of opportunity for high school sports. You get to play a lot of different types of schools, you're playing all boys schools, you're playing large schools, small schools, um, schools that have a very strong sports focus or schools that are very kind of academically or um, they have a, a mission focused schools. And so you get to experience all those different opportunities, but you still get to have those kind of rivalry games where our big rivalries are with like Canterbury. We have a big Canterbury day. And so we get a chance to go against local rivalries um, but still have that prep school experience. The Frederick Gunn School specifically um, is, I think, the perfect size. So we're just over 300 um, students, and so co-ed, and so and we're 85 percent boarders. So you have that real kind of traditional boarding school experience. Um, to go to the Frederick Gunn School is not for every uh, player. Some players really want just to kind of have basketball be the main focus. And for like the Frederick Gunn School, basketball is going to be a big part of what you're doing, but you're also going to be expected to be bought into the mission of the school. And the mission of the school comes from Frederick Gunn, our founder, in 1850. Um, and he's, uh, he's got this unbelievable uh, backstory that the school has really embraced. And it's about character 
Um, he was a leading abolitionist, so we have a lot of ju social justice components to it. Um, he was an outdoorsman. Um, he's founded the um, in the American Camping Association. They have Frederick Gunn as starting kind of recreational summer camping. So I take the basketball team, you know, kids from the city who've never been outside before, take them all camping as a team every year. We do things like that. And the one thing I came away when I visited your school two years ago, and then we just saw each other a few weeks ago up there, is you've got a four-year program that kids go to that kind of progresses each year that I think is very unique to your school. Can you just give a brief overview of what that is? Sure. So we received a, a grant that founded our uh, Center for Citizenship and Just Democracy. And so every student starts as a freshman in what we call our Pathways program. And that's what I teach. I'm the, the director of counseling at the school and I teach in the Pathways program. So it's an introduction to high school, helping people learn about themselves, learn about their environment and their community. Your second year, you're in Citizen Gun, which is a, a course kind of about ethics, finding your voice. What do you care about? What's your kind of story? What do you want to fight for? How do you want to become an active citizen in the world? Um, and then in your, your third year, you have uh, what's called a declaration. So every student gives similar to like a TED talk in front of the whole school. So the idea is you kind of learn um, about how you fit into the world your freshman year. Your, your sophomore year, you kind of understand who you are and what you care about. And your, your junior year, you put that, you know, put your, you, you stand up for what you believe in, get them from the school and you say something you think is important. And your senior year, you have a kind of a, a capstone project where you kind of give back to the world in some way. Um, so it kind of builds in that, in that fashion. Yeah, that junior year project. I mean, just all the skill sets that kids learning during that year is just... I love it. I mean, the, the getting over the fear of public speaking, having to be able to be concise, um, picking a topic they're going to learn about and be passionate about. I just, I just think that's fantastic, Brian. And, and it also plays in a lot to everything we do. We have um, a real focus on kind of like pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And so for some kids, public speaking, that's really hard for them. And we encourage them to try and overcome that and do that. But also like in our co-curriculars, like after school, I love my players to play a sport they've never played before, right? Learn how to be passionate about basketball, learn how to be the star of the team, right? But also learn how to be the guy that maybe has never done something, is struggling through, learning how to contribute through hustle and attitude and effort. Um, that's really valuable as well. Every kid gets kind of uh, scored in the classroom on what we call academic merits. So you get your grade point average and then you get your academic merit score. And it's kind of like, what kind of citizen are you in the classroom? Do you know your weaknesses? Do you push through them? Are you self-aware? Are you sharing time? Are you helping other kids uh, succeed? So it's kind of, we try to be on message in the athletics, in the dorm, in the classroom, just be a good citizen. All right, let's talk about the debate out there about kids going to a prep school and actually having to play a different sport versus just specializing in their sport. And yeah. very, very few of my clients ever come to me and say, hey, I wanna go to a prep school and do two sports because obviously it takes time away from training on your main sport. So if I'm a kid looking at, but you and another school competitor and I, your competitor only has basketball that the kid's going to do starting in you know, first week, he's doing open gyms, college coaches are coming in. H how do you pitch that to a family? I know they're all about range. You know, David Epstein's book that just came out talks about Tiger Woods specializing and Roger Federer doing a bunch of things up until the age of 14. But then from yeah. there, Federer started specializing, but at least he had that baseline going into it. But in high school, aren't you taking time away from potential open gyms in front of college coaches or, you know, that time used on football or soccer is not being used on skill development? Great. So at, at our, so I personally believe that cross training is good for you from a, from a mental health perspective, from um, allows you to kind of not get lower rates of burnout in your sport. And then from, a, from an injury perspective, I think there's good new data out that if you're doing different things, if you're exercising in different ways and competing in different ways, it makes you kind of stronger. Whereas if you just are specific to your one sport and you're training, you're more injury prone. So those are the two things. And then also like our, uh, we have players being recruited division one, division two, divi like high academic division three. That's kind of, we're kind of in that you know, we're not having kids going to Duke, mm -hmm. right? But we're, we're lo looking at those Ivy Patriot League kind of level schools. And then we have the kind of academic D2s, 
or the you know NESCAC kind of D3 schools. And so that's our kind of market. And our kids still, if they're on that college track, um, they're still getting up in the morning before school on the shooting machine or getting a lift in. We have like a kind of a college schedule for our classes. So very often you're going to have two hour breaks during the day where you're going to get back in the gym and get a lift in or get shots up or work on your homework. And then their other sport that they would do, whether it's cross country, eight man football, soccer, something like that, or it could be musical or the play or working on an instrument. So it doesn't always have to be a sport. You're just doing something different. A model UN counts, like those types of things. Um, those end around five o'clock. And so the kids will then eat and then they're back in the gym for our open gyms. We still have the college coaches come on Tuesdays was our, our day. We would have, you know, half dozen college coaches watching their open gyms on Tuesday nights. And so that they're still getting that. They just have to be really kind of organized about their time. By eight o'clock, they're in the dorm, study hall, eight to 10 prep school style. Perfect. So you're still, you can still day one, get your shots up, get your weightlifting in. And this other activity is only a small part of your full day. So it's okay. Perfect. I love that. Correct. Answer. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now you mentioned NEPSAC and we've had coaches on from all the different levels. And I think you're the first coach from class B and, right. you know, I've asked a lot of different level coaches. Does it matter if you're playing at a triple A school, double A, single A, B, C, I've asked this to prep school coaches and college coaches, like say it, there's a clone and one's the same clones at Brewster, the same clones at gun. Does not matter what league he's in? Um, how, when families ask you about the, cl the B class, you know, how do you answer uh, its advantages or, or disadvantages? So um, I don't, I think that when you get a B, a and B, I don't think there's much difference at all. A and B and in some leagues around the country where I've coached before, like in the MIA down in the Maryland, Baltimore, DC area, is kind of how you kind of petition up or you get dropped down if you're not competitive. That's not how we work. It's literally how many boys you have in the school. If you can't, you can win every year, or you can lose every game. You're either A or B. Once you get into double A or triple A, you're getting into kind of a, a different um, a different situation. They play with like the college three-point line or they'll play with the college rules or the, the longer uh, – like 20 minute halves instead of 16 minute halves. So there's a little bit different in the double A and the triple A. The rules are the same from a, the amount of work you can do out of season, the number of games you can play, that kind of stuff is not that different, but the, it is different in the sense that a lot of those schools are having two teams, right? Mm -hmm. So you're having the prep team and the varsity team or a blue team and a gold team. And so, and so you're talking about maybe having, you know, 25, 30 kids who think they're going to college to play basketball at your school. And that creates a lot of advantages at the AA and AAA level. At the Frederick Gunn School, at the B Conference, you're having maybe, like, we'll have eight kids on our team, right, that are trying to go to college. And so they're getting a lot more individual focus. Now they're still Division One kids. Every time we play a game, we're playing against – that kid's getting going to Rutgers, that kid's going to, you know, wherever, right? Like, so you're still getting the, a good level of competition. We still play double A schools, you know, we'll have um, B conference schools will play double A schools or triple A schools that you can still play across those lines. So it's not, I think that's a big thing people don't understand that who you play is not, is more based on geography and kind of tradition than what your division is mm -hmm. and then at the end of the year so there's 30 schools in b conference everybody plays whoever they want to play and then at the end there's like a committee like college football and they pick eight and they that eight plays in the playoffs um and that's the really the only time that they level that and then i would say that our b conference schools over the last four years have outplayed our top schools have outplayed the a conference um you know or we'll have a canterbury or a rivers or brooks consistently um play you know with with those higher higher level programs yeah that's a great explanation and that's something i talk to families about is you can go play in a triple a program and you might be on their developmental team right and there's 25 kids in the program and that's you know that's great or they can come to a program like yours where there's eight eight recruited basketball players in it 
right? right? So there's no right or wrong. It comes down to personal preference on what a kid's experience might want to be, right? Right. And so we, we've had our, we've had a 6'6", 225 pound, really good athlete. Um, and then he was a, he's a pitcher at UConn, but he was our power forward on the basketball mm-hmm. team. So our other players are, are, could be division one athletes in lacrosse or baseball or soccer. Um, they're, but it, it's kind of blended that way. But we, we keep our, I want to go to college basketball players to a smaller number than those other schools. And, and now I, you could be on that, that prep team, the, whatever the second team is at South Kent, and you could get recruited to the same schools that a B conference kid. So it's not one's better yeah. or worse. It's just a very different, a very different experience. Yep. It's a preference. And that's for people that don't know the prep school world. I don't know if they'd know those, those details and those differences. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to play a fun little segment here, Brian called famous alums from your school. And this okay. is not a, this is not a test, but I did go on Wikipedia today and pulled off three names that I thought were pretty big time. And we're just going to see if you know them or not. And Good. then if I left any obvious ones off, Please share those with us. First up is Dick Wolf. Yeah, right. So I've not met Dick Wolf, but Dick Wolf is a, is is a famous guy. Yep. Why is he famous? So uh, Dick Wolf is political, right? Is or is he the uh, broadcaster? He's the uh, creator of Law and Order. Oh, okay, Law and Order. So sorry, I'm missing. That's so, all right. The Law and Order. So that's a. a I don't know Dick Wolf. So oh, I know. I'm not saying you have to know him personally. Yeah. Also, I'm okay. just saying you, these are just. This is fun for everybody. Who's getting a little bit. Do I recognize? Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Tish. Okay, so we've got the Tish brothers, right? Um, so they are a great, great contributors in our alumni association. They come to campus. They visit. Uh, we have a new building. Uh, so they own the Giants and they own the Lowe's hotels. That's the way to answer your question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you but, go. <laughs> go ahead. Last one. This one's a tough one. Uh, uh, Andrew Lack. Well, I don't know Andrew Lack. Okay. Uh, chairman of NBC News for five years. Oh, there you go. Okay. Great. That was this week's. Oh, so did I leave anyone off that maybe I so shouldn't know? I, I like, I like OJ Abbott. So OJ Abbott was a basketball player who came here and he went to St. John's to play basketball, right? So good school, came from the city, went back to the city. And while he was here, he had to do exactly what you were saying had right. to do something that he didn't feel comfortable doing and someone said hey why don't you go out for the play so he goes out does the play really likes it really enjoys it ends up at st john's after four years of st john's figuring out what to do there's a broadway play and they need someone to be a basketball kind of specialist to help it he now is an award-winning director and producer on broadway and in movies and he comes to campus to talk about at the Frederick Gunn School, when they push you outside of your comfort zone, and you take advantage of that, it could change the course of your life. So I like Odege Abbott. I love that story. I, I've told that story to a lot of people, Brian, after you let me know about it last year when I visited for the first time. And it just, that it's more than basketball, right? I know everyone reaches out to us usually initially about basketball. And yeah, we want to get them to the next level and make their dreams come true. But it's so much more than that, right? And just that program yeah. your school offers can do things like you just mentioned there. So... All right, that was this week's segment of famous alumni from the prep school, Coaches Prep School. All right, back to the questions here. So being in mental health, I know you work a lot in that capacity at Frederick Gunn, and the two years of COVID has really taken a toll on this country's youth. Youth. What, what are some trends you're seeing just among your students that has changed, you know, pre versus post COVID? Um, I, I mean, it's been pretty dramatic. And there's a real, you know, ma- mental health crisis going on in our country. So it's something that we're talking a lot about. We're spending a lot of our time and energy on trying to make sure our kids have the resources that they need to be safe and successful. Um, I think what we're struggling with is that, you know, kids have felt really detached from the things that gave them a lot of fulfillment. So a lot of relationships, interpersonal relationships, a lot of that was really hard to maintain during the COVID years. And um, a lot more dependence on being on your phone and social media. That's been really kind of tough for kids. Resilience, being able to kind of like have two years where the expectations academically and um, were lower. And then all of a sudden you jump into a high 
pressure environment and you expect to keep up a lot of times a lot of kids lost information they lost repetitions with struggle and perseverance and kind of developing that grit um so while those are all really kind of difficult uh difficult times and i think it just you know i think that a lot of times during covid we all all of us went through dark spells where we felt kind of feelings and we you know maybe had people in our communities die and pass away and everything just seemed kind of surreal for a while i think we're kind of adjusting to getting back to some level of of normalcy but it's not like you said we were talking about earlier with illnesses that are going around like you know i've had three kids in the last 24 hours on my team go home for flu and we have other kids going home for covid and there's strep is going around it's like it's it's a thing that doesn't seem to stop right where all of a sudden um kids get sick and then they have to put their lives on hold again yeah and it, let me ask you this if you were king of america and you could write the prescription for today's teenagers like all right i need you guys to do this this and this and it's going to help you tremendously what would those mental health suggestions be well the, the first one is sleep sleep has been winning over like so many other things if you talk about therapy or medication i mean getting good solid sleep is really important to kids and they have a hard time um getting it right just the hours that they're on they're on their phone there's some there was a lot of research early on about being on your phone right before you go to bed and the blue light or whatever and how it was messing people up turns out that it's actually um some new research that talks about so let's say you like you you go through your day and you're bombarded with all these stimuli right, right. throughout the you're having conversations, sight, smell, sounds, you're learning things, it's all kind of hitting you. It's like too much to process. And then when you go to sleep, your brain kind of like organizes everything, processes everything, makes sense of everything. You help learn, help you learn, right, from what your day-to-day -day experiences is. And when you wake up in the morning, you are kind of groggy and you're kind of like, kind of get yourself up and those first 20 minutes when you wake up is when you kind of get the benefit of all the work your, your kind of unconscious mind, your subconscious mind did while you were asleep. Now, if you get on your phone, like they all do, like we all do, right when you wake up, you get stimulated out of that drowsy period into an alert phase. And we're losing all that time when you, that, you sh that your brain worked the whole night to persevere so there's this real push now to, to for all of us especially the kids to not be on your phone for as long as you can when you first wake up so you can get the benefit of all the sleep you just had so we're not getting enough sleep we're not getting healthy sleep and we're not in the before sleep and after sleep they're, they're really problematic so i think those are really important and then you have things like you got to exercise and you got to you know learn to talk about your feelings when you're struggling and get over that kind of stigma that it's not okay um, to be not okay. So I guess these these kids need to find kind of a mentor in their life just to just to vent to, or even a friend. Well, I mean, I get nervous, right? Because there's a lot, these kids use each other mm. as their therapist, Interesting. right? And then you end up, that I have more kids that are overwhelmed because they had to spend all night, you know, helping another kid, right? And so when you have kids that are struggling with dark thoughts, maybe self-harm, suicidal ideation, and you think that if you get off the phone with them, if you end the FaceTime early, something bad might happen to someone you care about, right? You're there. And if you think if you get help, right? If you tell someone, if you tell an adult, then you betrayed their trust. So you, there's so many stories we're getting of, of these adolescents leaning on each other almost too much right and and it you know there's these awesome um hotlines and chat lines that kids could access uh the national suicide hotline you know there's you know so there are all these different options where i just encourage kids if you have a friend that's in that situation call the hotline with them right yeah. get on there and chat with them so you're not carrying that weight on your own go to the the school psychologist or counselor and and maybe not mention the kid's name just make it anonymous to get comfortable 
starting to find out what are the resources you can get for them. So you're not just doing it all on your own. Yeah. And on that same vein, that just reminded me of something I'm not shared with anyone before publicly, but when I was a senior at the air force Academy, um, that summer I led my freshmen through basic training through the second half. So I had 35 of them. I was their squadron leader or flight commander, whatever it was. And uh, so I got pretty close with them. They trusted me. And one of my freshmen came to me and said, Hey, just so you know, Billy uh, told me he wanted to kill himself. Can you talk to him? Uh, so I went to, and, and he was, she wasn't, he wasn't, she wasn't supposed to tell. You know, I was supposed to be a secret. Billy said, I'm sharing it with you. Don't tell anyone. But they told me, I went and saw Billy and Billy's like, yeah, you know, you can't tell anybody or I'm going to get kicked out of the Academy. And I said, okay, okay. Um, and I immediately had to go and tell the chaplain because that was above my pay grade and yeah. he got, he got kicked out. So that's one of those situations too, as like the kid who's here and their suicidal friend, potentially on FaceTime at two in the morning, like there's a, it's a no win situation here. You're going to have to violate trust potentially to save a kid's life. And you know, right. it's, and that was tough as a 22 year old, let alone a 16 right. year old who's just mm -hmm. gone through two years of this. So it's, yeah it's a big responsibility to put on kids' shoulders. Yeah. And I think, I think we're doing a better job as schools and um, as a, as a society for a couple of different reasons. One, you know, there's a big thing on, on the, the daily on the New York times, that podcast, not to, to promote another podcast against yours, but the daily is a good podcast and they talked about mental health. And one of the things they talked about is the lack of resources that we have. Um, kind of this this issue where if you're a parent and you get to the point where you feel like your kid is in danger what do you do and what people normally do is they go to a pediatrician so they take mm -hmm. their kid to the pediatrician and the pediatrician gives them a questionnaire asks them a question the kid says i'm having these mental health crises and then the so then the pediatrician the problem with the pediatrician is what they're saying is we went over that for like a month like i i'm doing like you know i'm looking at all other parts of health all I needed, all I learned when I was in medical school as a pediatrician was if they're having a mental health crisis, refer them to who? The psychiatrist. That's the doctor that does mental health. Yeah. There are no psychiatrists. There are, and there are definitely no pediatric psychologists. There are, there's so few based to the need and the waiting lists are so long. So now you're in this, and they, what? They meet you for a little bit of time. They prescribe you a medication. So it's an inefficient system. So where do they send you? To the ER, right? So you <sighs> go to no the problem. ER. So you wait in the ER for two hours and the only person who got less training on how to deal with mental health crisis than the pediatrician is the ER doctor. They're dealing with car accidents. They're dealing with allergic reactions. Someone got shot. Someone had a stroke, right? All they're trying to do is put you into a waiting room so you can go somewhere else, right? So we're in the situation where these families are desperate and there's not a real system set up to support them. So at our, like, there's a much better opportunity now for kids to who might be struggling with mental health to not always be like if you're having these types of dark thoughts or if you're having behavior that you have to get kicked out of school no there's nowhere for you to go so a lot of times now like what can we do let's bring on some professionals on board let's work with your home therapist let's work with your doctors what is the support you need do you need to take a medical leave for a little while and then come back to school when you're ready let's not make it be where people are afraid to ask for help let's create a culture and environment where it doesn't end up the way you described that happened um you know at the air force academy where you know if you say there's anything wrong you're out because then people won't say there's anything wrong now it's a little bit different when you're dealing with you know the level of clearances and whatever you need at the academies but at, at our level i really believe there's a movement towards kind of destigmatizing and lowering the risk uh, profile for schools to work with families to help get the kids the support they need while they stay in their communities. Yeah, no, on top of that, though, if there's no resources nearby, there's been a big proliferation recently on online counseling, like better help or better health. Um, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? My, my quick thoughts looking at it from the outside is, well, if these guys were busy in their local community, they wouldn't need to go on here. Or is it more convenient for the doctors? Or what, what are your thoughts on the online therapy? So I think it's fine. I don't have any problem with it. I think it's a good resource. I think that you're able to access. Um, I, th I think it's. 
I'm good at what I do, but I don't think I would be the best one for every single problem, right? Whereas, so with, when you open up the online world, you have a wider opportunity to have a specialist that can have easy access to you, and then you could be able to interact with them. Now, there, there are different types of therapy. Mm -hmm. Some of the therapies, like behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of them are skill-based right? So you're going to a therapist, they're telling you to try things, do things or teaching you techniques, then you go out in your life, you try them and do them and you come back and say what worked and didn't work. I think that the online thing can work really well for that. Other types of therapy that are more kind of relational, or they're kind of more dynamics, you know, where you need that where the, the kind of the connection you make with the therapist is the therapeutic benefit of it. Those I feel like, you kind of need to be in person uh, for teenagers. You know, it's a little bit tough depending on how engaged they are because they, you know, they'll be in therapy and they'll be on their phone just like when they were on Zoom class, they'll be on their phone. So that that's not, I don't think always great, um, but I, I don't mind it. I think it's fun. You told me a story uh, a few weeks ago that you had a girl in your office who was depressed and you said, show me your phone. Yeah. Tell, tell me, tell me what, uh, tell me about that. So I, I just think that, the, the um, well, there's two things. I think that's awesome about kids with phones now. So a lot of times they don't realize how many hours they're on their phone. And so that's a big wake up call. The other thing that's cool with teenagers is that there's like usually records of all their like last fights. So if someone had a fight with somebody, you can kind of like, you don't have to take their word for it. You can go to the, you can go to the tape. And as a coach, I like to go to the tape. So I'm like, all right, let me pull, pull up the fight and walk me through it. And when you see that they, they're posting like multiple paragraphs and the other person in the fight is like, yeah. And then multiple paragraphs and there's like, okay. Then, you know, you can help them realize the, the power dynamic that's going on there. Yeah, it's like breaking down game film, but for like teenagers. But you also mentioned too, Both like ones. time on a certain app called TikTok. Like explain that to me. Too. Yeah. yeah, TikTok. I mean, there's a whole other type of, I can go for a long time, but. Give me the so, give me the abbreviated version. <laughs> so, you know, TikTok tickles a part of our brain that mm -hmm. releases this dopamine. And um, you end up kind of like having these crashes. Like it's really kind of stimulating. It makes you kind of feel kind of like you're getting something out of it. But it's like, you know, potato chips. Like you're eating them and eating them and eating them. And then afterwards you feel like crap. There's a real drop. And we don't have an infinite amount of this stuff. Right. Right. And so you use it all up. Um and then you feel like crap when when it when it burns out, and it's just so. The, the the good thing is is the distraction, right? It takes your mind off where you're at, but like you're then you know replacing all the kind of healthier ways. There's a cool research out now about kind of the way that we should work is that our body will naturally produce dopamine through struggle. If you work hard at something, then you're, it's kind of like the runner's high you, you hear about. Like when you work hard at something, you actually feel kind of good about it. Um, and so we've gotten away with it with all these kind of like shortcuts to feeling good about things that we've lost the ability to understand that the hard work, the grind is what feels good. Now, the athletes, at our level that we coach and that go on to go, they allow those kids, they're either supremely talented or they're some, they're tall or, you know, or they're grinders, right? They like outworking, they like working. And those are the ones that ha are going to be the happiest and they're going to be able to, you know, be successful. Going back to our original question about why we make these kids do difficult things that they're not good at that they don't want to do mm -hmm. is because once you do that, and you learn to kind of enjoy, you know, working out lacrosse or cross country, which you never thought you would do, or working at the pottery wheel and ceramics and getting all frustrated. And then all of a sudden finding a little bit of peace and joy in that, that carries over, you know, hard, that the hard work in one thing carries over to everything else. You, your brain just learns that working hard, right, feels good. And then that once you have that, then then things really kind of work out for you. Yeah, those are great foundations to have that applies everywhere else. So um, let's talk about you a little bit. You came to Frederick Gunn from Hawaii. Tell right. us what so, you were doing out there. 
So I was in Annapolis, Maryland. I went to Annapolis when I was working as a, a pre-doctoral intern at the Johns Hopkins Kennedy Krieger Institute. And there I started helping Don DeVoe at the Naval Academy doing sports psychology as a volunteer for the basketball team for a couple of years. From there, I started, I worked in a private practice in Annapolis, Maryland, and started coaching at St. Mary's Annapolis and had a great setup, lived downtown, walked to St. Mary's, got to hang out at the Naval Academy. Um, my wife was an, is an attorney. She had, could ride her bike to work and started having a family. Mm -hmm. When we had our fourth boy, right, and I had been coaching for almost 10 years and um, we decided to kind of blow it up and do something different. So we moved to Hilo, Hawaii, which is on the news right now because there's Mauna Loa is erupted and the lava is like slowly rolling towards my house <laughs> in Hawaii. So we moved there and I work at a therapeutic um, horticultural therapy program, a wilderness kind of program for adolescents and young adults in um, Hawaii. So I worked there for two years um, three summers, two years. And in that, a lot of the kids that were in these programs end up going to prep schools. And so I started to think about prep schools and the opportunity to do all the things that I love, be around my family, right? As they're getting to the age where I want to spend a lot of time with them. Maybe I could help out with the basketball team and get to be, do some coaching and get to do my professional life in psychology. So I found the Frederick Gunn School. At that time, it was called the Gunnery. And um, I still go back every summer and work that same job in Hilo. So I kind of go back and forth. And so I was here. I would help out with the basketball team. I work with the, uh, as the director of counseling, I teach a little bit and work with all the student leaders. And then right before COVID, they asked if I wanted to take over um, the basketball program. And I was mm. really excited to get a chance to uh, recruit the world and, um, you know, bring in good kids who want to, reach their goals or try to awesome now going back to this summer program you work in hawaii explain to people what that is because i i'm not sure what it is but it sounds very interesting so when you're struggling with something in your life a lot of times you need to kind of get away and mm -hmm. have like a break and so it's a 10 week program about it could be maybe eight weeks it could be maybe 12 weeks it's about a 10 week program and you kind of like unplug, you go to this therapeutic program, you work in a farm and you, you know, do yoga, paddleboard, eat uh, anti-inflammatory, all organic diet, and you grind. It's like if it's daytime, you're outside and you're working. And so a lot of these kids who have been playing video games and won't leave their room, maybe they've experienced a trauma. Maybe they're struggling with anxiety or depression. <clears throat> Maybe they're, they, their parents are trying to decide do they need to be on medication or not. We have psychiatrists, we have naturopathic physicians, we have therapists. So it's a lot of therapy, a lot of like overall life skills. And then kind of like if we took control and did everything we thought was right and made the kids do it. So we know we, they go to bed with the sun, they wake up with the sun, they exercise a certain amount, we keep, they drink a certain amount of water every day, they eat a certain diet every day. And then throughout the course of that time, the idea is that you transition those skills more to them. Instead of kind of requiring them to do it, you're giving them opportunities to do it kind of independently. And then um, helping the families and the kids make decisions about where they go next. Do they go back home? Do they go to a boarding school to get a, a clean start? Do they need more therapeutic intervention moving forward? So we kind of help the kids uh, get stabilized, assess, um, give some interventions, and help them find the next uh, next step. It sounds like almost every high school in America could benefit from some form of this. Right. Yeah, and didn't I they mean, do it in I, the old I, days, like waking up in the field, you know, working your job all day, playing basketball outside, going to sleep because well, you're exhausted? I was talking to, uh, I think, a, an educational consultant because so they have educational consultants just like what you do, but for finding the right mm -hmm. school for different reasons that are outside of sports. And these, cons what I said that used to happen um, in the olden times, you just you had like a cousin or an uncle that had a farm somewhere else and you just go right. live there right <laughs> right you're going to 
Uncle Bob's in Iowa. And you're like, whoa, you had a whole different life there. And you had to kind of figure that out. And it gave you a break. You learned different skills and you kind of grew up, you know, so. And then sometimes Uncle Bob's kids would get sent to the big city to learn those that <laughs> yeah. skill sets exactly. over the course of a summer. Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the great part of growing up too is that. But that just, you know, I think you said it early in the conversation where like sleep, exercise, going to bed with the sun, getting your circadian rhythm in check like these are basics but you know this guy right here and growing up not knowing a world without this gotta be tough for kids so i give them a lot of grace because it is a a tough world they're going into but my gosh and here's my here's my idea if i ever make enough money where i can just do what i want to do i thought about starting a program to where if, if before you graduate high school if you run a marathon you get some scholarship to college <laughs> right. And and it's uh, the benefits of a couple of things. One, you're going to be in shape. Two, you got to yep. have discipline. Three, you got to have to learn how to train when you don't want to, which creates resiliency. And four, you know, once you cross that finish line, you're going to have such amount of pride that no one can ever take from you. Yep. And then yep. if you then go off into the world in college, you're going to have a different skill set just by doing that one thing there. So I've actually offered my nieces and nephews like a thousand bucks. I said, Hey, I give you a thousand bucks. And after you won the race, I'll pay for the shoes you bought. I'll pay for your entry fee. Yeah. And uh, I think one might take me up on it because he's trying to save for a backpacking trip, but they haven't wanted to do it. But what are your thoughts on a kid doing a marathon before they turn 18? I think it would be awesome. There's, there is a therapeutic program. And their thing is that every kid, this is, a, I think, a, a year. It's like you do it like a therapeutic school, but every kid has to do a triathlon. Oh. <laughs> so that that's the the they're, they're training for a triathlon while they're at school and their graduation is doing a triathlon. Yeah. Yeah, but Brian, <laughs> wouldn't just that right there and this and what you gain from training for that and doing that, wouldn't that cure 75% of the problems or not? Is some of this stuff chemical and no, no, no. With it? yeah, no, some of the, some, of, I think there would be some benefit in that, but I think that that's kind of what a lot of our kids, our kids do with sports, right? Mm -hmm. Like when, and, but when they're in that mode, they're doing well, but when they get a knee injury, right when they when it gets taken away from them then there's this real like uh crisis point for a lot of the athletes because so much it's like um when everyone invested in in housing at the same time you want to diversify your your resiliency portfolio mm -hmm. right it can't all be on exercise i i work in private practice with a couple women who were having real mental health crisis kind of out of nowhere they had good lives there was no really identifiable thing and they were all in their kind of mid-20s and i was trying to figure out what is going on they were they were college swimmers or college track runners and when they stopped because they they aged out all that they had put they didn't realize how much they were regulating their neurochemistry because all through their development, all through puberty, all through adolescence, right? All through, they've all, always been exercising at this crazy level. And when they stopped, their body almost had like a rebound back, like a withdrawal from all what they were doing uh, to keep up with it. And it threw them into kind of mental health issues. Would that so, have been yeah, from the dopamine, you, not, like that runner's yeah. high they're not getting anymore? And it's Yeah. Yeah. Like their body was just used to having that to help kind of regulate them. And when it was taken away from them, they didn't do well. And you see, I mean, this is a big thing we're seeing. Yes, with the CTE stuff with concussions, but in general, like when you take the 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 competitiveness, the the exercise away from our athletes, when it was such a big part of who they were, what do they do? How do they replace it? And some of us get into coaching, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and, that, and that's what you do to try and try and figure out something else to do. Going back to your time at the Naval Academy under Don DeVoe, um, what did you notice in those players that maybe made them different versus an average college player? Well, my favorite uh, story is being at practice. And when, you know, Coach DeVoe was, you know, old school. So he, he didn't keep a, an even temper throughout the whole <laughs> practice. When kids made mistakes, he let them know. So he was upset about something and he had them do push-ups. And so they all started doing push-ups. And then at the end of it, the kids jump up, right, ready to run to the next drill, and someone yells Marine Corps. And all the kids who are going for Marine Corps, they just ripped out another half, another set just to show them <laughs> there's another gear, right? So I just love that. I love that there is, like, no matter how hard you're working, 
you know, there's someone else that can say, Hey, all right, let's do another set. And just, just because we can. Right. So I love, I love that part of it. Yeah. That's great. You know, I was supposed to originally go to Navy and Don to ever crew to me and we got falling out and ended up at air force. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, that's, that's a great program. And you, that's how we bonded as you and I started talking to Academy sharing yeah. stories and whatnot. Um, yeah, is there I, was something- just, I was just a volunteer. There was one, one I was right there where they, there was a, a coaching position to open and I asked about it and he ended up giving it to one of his former players as, as it happens. And, and I'm happy with the way it turned out, but I, it was, you, you, you have these moments where, wow, things could have been different. I could have been stopping a psychologist, gone full time into coaching. And then he left like the next year or something. <laughs> and then, then what would have happened, you know, in, oh. the, in the course of things, I think Brian. Billy Lang came after that. Yeah. Billy Lang. Yep. And see, that's yeah. where I started my relationship again with Navy was with Billy Lang. And I think Ron Ginyard, um, yeah. but that's the thing, like the assistant coach found a better player than me and they, they lied to me and they, they offered this kid and pulled my offer. And I know that assistant coach and I still, he's still coaching in high level basketball now, but without him making that decision, which put to him probably didn't put much time into it. Cause I was no big time athlete right. changed the course of my life. And I think now when my, you know, when I've got clients and kids, like, trying to choose between, oh, am I going to gun or this school? Like, which one should I choose? I'm just sitting back going, you can't go wrong. They're both great options, but my gosh, your your life is going to go on a completely different trajectory. Yep. And you do this too when you're advising your kids on which college to choose. Like, you know, as an adult, like your your future wife is at this school. You're, yep. you know, you might be a billionaire at this one. You might end up in a gutter at this one. We don't know, but it's that sliding door moment that yeah, the it, there's only a few of those like in life. This. Yeah, the butterfly effect. This takes it all the way. Up. Well, I mean, I think what it's interesting you bring this up, right? So when I was younger and I was going for my championship, so we we went to three championships at St. Mary's and won two of them. And so there, it was just like you just when you're younger, you feel like it's like an or at least for me, I felt like it was like an arms race. You want all the good players, right? You're going to like Damathas, JV, and be like trying to see if they want to come over. It's like this is real competitive to try and get the best athletes you can. And it's, it's that now it's totally different. Like I'm like close to 50 and I'll, all I want to do is give me, you know, a handful of kids mm-hmm. that want to go on a journey that aren't going to give me a hard time when I want to try and take them camping. <laughs> right. They're going to get up and get up early. And if we win, we win, we lose, we lose, but it's going to be a good story. Right. I keep the numbers low and I have two kids. So I, um, my best player, a kid named Tristan Davis, who's awesome, 6'6", 220, you know, run through a wall for you, and then he'll just, you know, come down and catch a dunk on the other end. He's got flu, and we're about to go to the Scholar Round Ball Classic play up at Babson. It was going to be a big weekend for him. Now we're going to have someone else going to have to step up. We have such a small number of college track players, and then we had another kid get flu today. So now we're, like, looking down, like, all right, baseball kid. Mm -hmm. time to play basketball right let's see how we do and it's kind of exciting and fun and so i've changed my whole philosophy of recruiting i want to keep the numbers small i want the kids to come and have a a, go on an adventure and a journey together um and i don't want to have a story of a kid who came and then it didn't turn out to be what he wanted and he ended up on a lower level team or not playing so you know that's just for me it's just not worth it anymore. You know, maybe we won't win as many games, but I'm upfront about it. You know, I say, Hey, this is the deal. There's going to be right now. We have six. If one of the six of you like sprains an ankle, we got five. So let's get in shape. Right. Yeah, but that's great. You like, realized it. Yeah. And, and that's mature too. Like there's still guys out there uh, in the NEPSEC league that are grinding every year to get those 12 D one guys. And that's their, that's their thing. That's their mission. That's fine. Um, But I see the toll it takes. I see the bandwidth that's expended with a lot of high major guys, with potentially two teams. And now you're comfortable knowing like, all right, I win a class B title. Awesome. Great. Put a banner up on the wall. But like, is that going to fill a hole in your heart? Probably not. So now you know like what players you want. And and you see that in college systems too, right? Oh, especially with the transfer portal. I mean, what are we doing now, right? So like Donovan Mitchell goes to Canterbury. He's there for two years, then he goes to Brewster, and then he goes to Louisville, whatever. So, I mean, this one change, not – but now if you're a Division One coach and you're going to bring in, like, an 18-year-old, and then they're going to – if they get good, then they're going to go up to a different higher division their sophomore, junior year, and then you bring in – or you bring in a, a, an awesome one and done, and then they go after you. 
it's like it's all of it's uh, so complicated now like the idea of of what are we trying to do and why are we trying to do it it just becomes going back to like you said the process oriented you've got to find something that feels like resonates with you like what do you like to do and for me it's like i want to get these kids and i want to have them for a couple of years and go on an adventure <laughs> that's what i want to do i want to take a kid that's never struck a match before right and have him light a fire and i want to have a kid you know play against top level competition and have to sit down and decide do i want to take that offer to that nescac school in the fall or do i want to wait for that d1 offer in the spring that might not be as good an academic school as the nescac school right and talk about changing the course of your life that's like a that's an interesting like decision these kids have to make right but so. Brian, but with that being said, they're looking for you and to guys like you, to guys like me, like, what should we do? We can't tell you. You have to make that decision on your own. And there's no right answer. There, there, there's wrong answers sometimes. There's better answers, but it's bird in the hand, two in the bush. And, I, you know, when I was up there a few weeks ago, uh, I talked to some families that, I, you know, my, the kids were now doing postgrad years and they're stressing now. It used to be in before COVID, the postgrad kids were like, oh, that's cool. You know, maybe I'll sign early. Maybe I'll get something in the fall. Now, not much is coming in the fall. So they're now, yeah. where they should have been more relaxed their post-grade year, they're feeling that same stress they felt senior year because it's their last chance. Like, is coach going to find me a spot? And guys in your position have to tell the families, like, look, you got to relax. We got to let the transfer portal kind of play itself out, and then we'll place you. And then sometimes you got to make a decision in 48 hours to go to a school. It It is madness. But parents are looking for the prescription of tell us what to do. We'll do it. And you can't do it. Every situation is different. And that's it's frustrating for me to even say that to families, but it's even worse now. And, and that's not even getting into the NIL bills and all that. That's a whole other, you know, issue. Not and, and we haven't had players at that level yet that were that they're like deciding money that they might be able to make by this school or that school. And you know, so it's a whole different, a whole different, you know, level of uh of pressures and decisions and stuff. Well, let me pipe in on that. So in New Haven at that prep school event, I saw one of my buddies who was an assistant coach uh, up until last year at a power five school and he quit. And I said, why'd you quit? He goes, it's all about the NIL now. Like, it's no longer about development. It's no longer about mentorship. All these recruits and their families want to know is how much can we get if we come to your school? And he's like, that's not why I got in the coaching. So that's not for a lot of the players we work with. That's not one yeah. of the big things they're looking at, but it's, 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 it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird world. We're sending these kids off to when they get to college. And then, you know, I've, I've beaten this, like it's a dead horse, but D one, right? Like every kid's like, I want to go D one, D one, but like go to ESPN plus and watch some of these D one games. There's no one there. You have a one in seven team playing a zero and eight team, like with, with a, a bad education in a, in a bad part of the U S like with no alumni network, like that's D one, but like, is that better for you than going to maybe a better option at a D2, D3 level. So it's constant well, I, I'm evolution. Wondering if, yeah, well, I, I, to me, I was thinking, like, what would be the best thing to do? And I think the best thing, I would, for if it was me, you're looking at definitely, like, what school would you want to go to if the basketball wasn't out there? Like, would you, you know, try to see if you could find a school you would actually want to go to, right? So start with that. But then, are you going to, like, play? Because if you go to a, a lower school, and you're playing and you make all conference and you're there for a couple of years with a transfer portal, you'll have a chance to do something different. And I bet if you took two kids of similar talent and one goes to a mid-major and sits on the bench for two years and then they transfer and one goes to Williams and they make all conference for two years and they transfer, they'll probably finish graduating the, the, the NESCAC kid might end up graduating from a better D1 program, right? Because they got to play, they played in packed houses, they played under pressure, and then when they were, their body matured, they decided just to, to make a change to go to, you know, a, a better D1 option. I think that might be the new, like, path is to kind of do a couple of years at a place that you're really going to get to play with fans and campus culture and play and then go for a couple of years. Um, like I went to the University of Florida 
and I looked at their roster with Coach Golden. They're doing a great job down there. There's like three or four kids that like got recruited out of high school there. <laughs> the whole rest of the team are transfers. It's just and he did an article where he's talking about like unless you are a like one and done type person from Florida or the connection to the school, it's better to kind of like spend a lot of time on in the portal and get these like all Americans from, you know, St. Joe's or VMI or <laughs> wherever you're gonna go and and then bring them in. I don't know. The whole thing is changing. Well, have you heard this yet? Where D3 coaches are saying, come here, we'll develop you, and we'll help you get to the D1 level. Yeah, that's what I would say. But that's gross. I did, that then I, That's just – it's like a starter wife almost. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone's got to do their own recruiting. That's, that's, that's in your hands. I put that in the prep school. Well, you're, you're back to TikTok, right? Like for, for, for a TikTok generation, two years, that's like a big commitment. Oh, like no. th- even thinking of being in the same place for four years. And especially when you've been switching AAU teams every season, you played at three high schools, two years out of college, you're like, yeah, that's a pretty big commitment. But I mean, yeah. four years is just because we think of it as like, that's what you used to do. But for, for kids, two whole years at the same place, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's enough for them. I don't know. Uh, Brian, is there anything in this conversation that we didn't touch on mental health wise or basketball or Frederick gun wise that, that we, we should chat about? Um, I think that the, so when I was at the Naval Academy, I got my hands on the U S Olympic mental skills training manual. And I've always tried to implement that with not just basketball players at Frederick Gunn, but even during COVID, we did a, a course on it where every week we would bring on other coaches and we just go through chapters of this, uh, manual to help with those sports psychology elements. And I think that's really the future of all sports. There's so much about how to prepare yourself to get the most out of your potential that comes through the sports psychology. I really think that's going to be an interesting um, next level. And, and one of the things I would encourage people if they haven't done it before is to check out something called progressive muscle relaxation. You can just YouTube it. it takes like 20 minutes. And it's a way of tensing and relaxing your mm-hmm. muscles and the systematic format that allows you to really understand what it feels like when you're relaxed and what it feels like when you're tense and how to shift between those phase states. And I think the work with biathletes, which is like an awesome sport, like it's cross country skiing, incredible cardio, heart speed out of your chest. Then you stop and you sniper fire a rifle where you have to be completely still. You can't be like, and so they use this progressive muscle relaxation to shift between this kind of like amped up state to like totally calm and relax. And so if you're having anxiety and stress, you can feel it. You can take a couple of deep breaths and you can relax yourself. In sports, that's going from dunking on somebody with an and one dunk and then shooting a free throw mm-hmm. to make that lat, right? If you're a hockey player, it's getting off the ice and then getting your recovery time. And you'll see like, how do you, how do you take those breaths and calm yourself down before you throw the next pitch, right? Or before you get in the batter's box, right? I love that bull Durham where he's like talking to himself and he gets out of the batter's box, like those types of things where you have to, to figure out how to control your physiology. And then you're kind of like, what's going on in your head so you can reach your potential. Love it. Cutting edge stuff here. You're sharing with us, Brian. Uh, a <laughs> couple quick fire questions here to end this sure. up. What's the biggest win of your coaching career? Wow. So where, when I was at St. Mary's Spalding with Rudy Gay. That was like the the neighborhood rivals. Like here, so lucky me, I go from having to play Spalding as the rival to now I play Canterbury as the rival. I'm not look good at picking rivals. <laughs> so <laughs> when we get there, um, there was a Josh Hartman, who's a five eight point guard who was like a lifelong Spalding kid, and he was just one of those kids that he was gritty and tough. He ended up, I think, going to Messiah for for basketball and. He, um, he, he got kind of basically told like, you're, you're never going to be at Spalding. Right. So he ended up transferring to St. Mary's. So I had this kid and we kicked the, I don't know if you can cuss on this. We kicked the shit out of them. The the first time we played them at their place, just blew them out. And to see this kid go to the school that basically said he wasn't good enough and just bang threes from all over the court and playing it up tempo and having that 
game where at St. Mary's we, we had been very good and then all of a sudden to get that kind of big signature win um, on their court, that was a pretty cool, pretty cool win. Nice. Who's the best player you ever coached against? I played against Jason Kidd and when I was in high school. He was the best player. When I think of that, that's that kind of like sticks into my head. I remember he was coming down the court and talking to his coach. He had three quarters of the court to go. And off the dribble, he threw a one-handed alley-oop pass to somebody who just happened to be cutting down the court. And I was like, whoa, this is different. And he was my same size. I'm like 6'4". I'm playing power forward, and he's playing point guard. <laughs> right. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching or counseling or being a parent? Um, so I got in my COVID thing. I got into axes, chopping wood and spoon carving. So I can take an ax and take a piece of wood and turn it into a spoon. So that's, that's, I'm I'm a pretty decent juggler also. That is awesome. That is awesome. Only coach I bet with that skill set in America. Uh, and lastly, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, wow. Or top movie, and no one's yeah. judging you. No, those are good ones. I think I'm a big Princess Bride guy. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of Princess Bride. I like that one. Um, good movies. And then I've been kind of like like the Quentin Tarantino stuff is pretty good, but I like I think Princess Bride. That's one I think I would I like watching that one. Well, perfect. Well, Brian, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. You you offered so much that we've not had on here before with all your mental health suggestions, your experience. Um, and sharing all that. So just want to thank you very much for coming on. No problem. Maybe maybe we'll get uh, Billy from Millbrook on uh, and we'll do one with him too. We can bounce uh, mental health ideas off each other. Great idea. Where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, so there's nothing. I am on zero social media. Good for you. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have Twitter. I don't have, apparently I have Facebook. I didn't realize it. Um, I must not have used it for the last like 10 years. Uh, so you you have to call me. So I can give myself a number out or you can call the Frederick Gunn School. Koenig B at FrederickGunn.org. Uh, okay, perfect. Thanks for sharing that. So everybody, thanks uh, Dr. Brian Koenig today for joining us on the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like this, be sure to tell your friends and subscribe at YouTube where we put up bonus content or subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Uh, we've got some great stuff recently. we got a Navy SEAL that's been on recently who talks about resilience and grit. Uh, I do a quick podcast on the state of the prep school world and what's going on with that. But uh, any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Prepathletics.com is the website. I get back to anybody. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Have a great winter and uh, we'll talk to you soon.